Good evening and welcome everyone. My name is Sue Adams and I'm the chair of the Whistler Institute and we're a registered Canadian charity dedicated to influencing change and inspiring minds through education and thought leadership. So welcome to the eighth event of the Whistler Institute's Global Perspective Se uh, Speaker Series here at the Murray Young Arts Centre. The event is being held on the traditional unceded territories of the Squamish Nation and the Leewak Nation who have lived here since time immemorial, and we're honored to live, work, and learn on their land. I would like to thank tonight's event sponsor, Cascade Environmental Resources Group, and um, their support enables the Whistler Institute to continue to provide access to critical education content. So this has been a busy week for Candace and the team from uh, Cascade, as they were also a sponsor at last night's Whistler Excellence Awards. So um, we thank you for your continued community contributions. It is through the support of local businesses like Cascade, individuals and foundations, who you'll see on our screen, um, and also mentioned on our website homepage, all committed to advancing lifelong learning in our community. So just a couple of housekeeping notes. This event is being recorded and uh, photographed. The video and photos will be made available on the Whistler Institute website. So just a little reminder, maybe turn those phones to silent. Um, so we expect today's uh, presentation to run around 45 minutes. And before we invite you, the audience, then to participate in a Q&A session, and we aim at um, ending up around 7.15, 7.30. So let me introduce tonight's talk. The Whistler Institute recently signed a memorandum of understanding with Capilano University, which commits, commits the two organizations to work together to benefit the Sea to Sky region. We're delighted that Paul Dangerfield, President and Vice Chancellor of Capilano University, will join us tonight to talk about how our, uh, higher education is changing. Paul has traveled extensively after the last year and even this week, and will be sharing some of his learnings with us tonight, as well, of course, addressing the newly acquired Quest campus and some of the Cap Cap Capilano University's plans for, the, plans for the campus. So I'll just give a little background on Paul before we invite him um, to speak to us. Paul Dangerfield assumed the role of Capilano University third president and vice, Ch vice chancellor on October 1, 2016. In his role, Paul is leading Capilano University forward in pursuit of its vision and mission as a regional university that promotes student access, career preparation, and life readiness for graduates to contribute as responsible citizens in a rapidly changing world. Previously, Paul was the executive director and Vancouver campus dean of the New York Institute of Technology and was dean of Capilano University's Faculty of Business and Professional Studies from 2006 to 2009. Prior to his role with the New York University of Technology, Paul was the vice president of education, research and international uh, with British Columbia's Institute of Technology from 2009 to 2014. Um, from 1985, he spent 20 years with the Canadian Forces in a variety of increasingly senior roles that included Chief of Staff, Commanding Officer, and Vice President of Human Resources. I'm exhausted, Paul, just listening to this. Paul Dangerfield has served on a wide variety of boards, including current board chair of the British Columbia Association of Institutes and Universities, West Vancouver Chamber of Commerce, BC Council on, Admin on, on Admissions and Transfer, and the BC Technology Education Careers Council. He's also a volunteer community leader with the United Way of the Lower Mainland Campaign Cabinet, an executive committee member of the Business Council of British Columbia, and a board member with Economic Partnership North Vancouver. Leadership was Paul Dangerfield's specialty when he completed a Master's of Business Administration at Royal Roads University. He also holds a Bachelor of Science in Chemistry from Carl Carlton University. Ladies and gentlemen, Paul Dangerfield. Okay, uh, am I on? We're good? Good to see everybody. Thank you so much uh, for joining us uh, this evening. Um, I'll get it out of the way. The boot had nothing to do with mountain biking, had nothing to do with trail running. 
and had everything to do with a ladder and painting. And so uh, <laughs> there, uh, there is a lesson there when you uh, get over 50, and I'm a little way older than 50, stay off the ladder. So uh, I will be doing that going forward. Right, Doug? Right. Yeah, good. Okay, thanks very much, everybody, uh, for the opportunity here to, uh, to have a chat. Uh, shout out to my colleagues here from Capilano University. So there's uh, folks up from the Tazil Learning Center. It's really great to have you here. Um, so, uh, interestingly, when I was asked to do this, um, it was uh, before we purchased uh, the campus in Squamish, and now that's all everybody wants to talk about. So I'm going to make sure we have some time to do that here in the session because there's some pretty exciting things here. And I think it actually is very relevant to the conversation that I would like to have uh, with you, um, which I'm calling, and I hope you to, I'd like you to actually see if you can pick up on, on the nuance between this slide and the one I'm going to put at the, at the end, which is uh, the next higher education paradigm. Um, and and uh, so... Um, it, it is grounded very much on some of the things that I have been able to do and I had the good fortune of being able to do over the last couple of years as I travel around the world and uh, see what other uh, jurisdictions, what other regions of the world, how they're actually moving forward with higher education, what their challenges are, what, the, what their opportunities are. And so um, there's, there's a couple slides here and there's one slide that I'm actually going to present that I've actually used that one slide for uh, a series of three-hour lectures. So that's how complicated it is now getting. No, no, I'm not going to do that here today, I promise. Um, but um, it's, uh, it is something that is going to give that perspective from around the world. But I'm going to try and bring it right back to, to here in Whistler, specifically in Whistler, and to what we're doing um, uh, as a university in the region here. Okay, so let me start um, with a little bit of background. How many alum are in the room uh, from Capilano? Okay, great. Good to see a couple of you here. So thank you very much. Um, so a little bit about uh, Capilano University. So uh, we are named after Chief Joe Capilano. Um, it's, we're not named after the river. We're not named after the bridge. It is Chief Joe Capilano. It's really important to us that we share that with you. Uh, Chief Joe Capilano was an advocate, a champion for education, and obviously for his community. Um, and it is something that uh, we're very proud of, uh, that we have uh, one of uh, the elders at the university, uh, Elder Latash Nahaney, is a, is a direct descendant of, um, of uh, Chief Joe, and he often tells us the stories of how great a, a person he was and how much champion uh, for education he was. We have a lot of work on this front, and I'm going to talk a little bit about it later. Um, Capilano University, at the time, we were Cap College, like so many other places. We appropriated the name, and I'll just, I'll just name it right now. The family was never asked if we could name the college after Chief Joe. Uh, it, we just, it's the way things were done back in the 60s. So let me just tell about some of the fun things that we've done. Uh, we uh, f formed in 1968. We were in the basement of... Uh, of uh, the uh, West Van High School. Um, at the time, I think we had about 700 students year one. Um, and since then, uh, we've grown uh, to take on a new region. We are actually referred to as a regional university um, after becoming, uh, transitioning in 2008 uh, from a college to a, U, uh, to a university. We are a regional university, and our region actually is the North Shore, uh, the Sunshine Coast, and the Sea to Sky all the way up to um, uh, Mount Curry and to to Zill Learn, Learning Center where the Lillooet Nation is, and so we reach all the way out there. And it's actually there's a map in uh, Victoria that shows this is the region that we're responsible for. Okay, and the new region um, I refer to the Squamish campus. Um, it uh, as you know, uh, we were able to uh, acquire the campus. Um, it's 160,000 square feet, 22 acres, and we were able to acquire that in August of this year. We can talk a little bit more about that, um, maybe in the Q&A, uh, about what, what, what our plans are and what we would like to be able to do it. But there, you see Elder Latash on, the, on your left, uh, along with Elder Delia from the Squamish Nation. Uh, me, uh, one of our students, Staza, she's actually a student in the Early Childhood Care and Education Program. Um, and uh, our minister, Minister Robinson, and the mayor uh, from the District of Squamish, too. So pretty, pretty exciting day for us, and I'll... I'll, I'll Spend some time maybe in the Q&A just uh, talking a little bit more about that. Okay, um, 
We uh, offer over 120 programs, um, of which we're now getting close to 20 degree programs in a wide variety, ranging from arts and sciences, uh, business and professional studies, uh, fine and applied arts, um, early childhood uh, or, uh, education, health and human development, and global and community studies. You can see a wide variety of it. And we're expanding those programs. As I said, um, we're, we're up to about almost 20 degree programs that we're working on with a goal to get to 30 degree programs in the next uh, 10 years, along with graduate studies as well. Again, I can take uh, more questions about this later on if you have specific questions about the university. Um, one of the things that we're doing now, too, that uh, is new for those who of you are alum, you probably weren't involved in doing this, but we do creative activity research and scholarship. That's our version of research. You'll hear other universities talk about their peer research. We call it CARS. It's a really fun name, and this is uh, a group of, uh, this is some of our students um, uh, with, uh, I think it's Tom Falls, uh, actually up in Squamish um, and doing some work in biology. And we're doing a lot of work on that. For example, you may have heard that we're partners with the Howe Sound Biosphere uh, right now, and we're actually doing a lot of work with folks there as well. Again, I can talk more about that if you have questions about it. Um, the nations. Uh, we're very fortunate to be on the land of five nations. Here you are on Squamish and, uh, and uh, the Loat Nation. We're also on Sisha Nation uh, in, up in uh, Squamish, uh, Musqueam, and the Tsleil-Waututh we work with. We also work very closely with um, um, uh, a, a, across the whole um, Western Canada, simply because uh, nations, uh, as students, Indigenous students who come pretty well from Alberta and BC, from all across, we actually also work with the Métis Nation and um, the urban nations as well. It's a it's a very, very important part of who we are as a university. We've got a lot of work to do on it, but I think we're getting closer and closer. And one of the ways that we are doing this is that back in 2018, we worked with, some of you may recognize, um, uh, up in the front uh, corner there, that's uh, Ray Natronaro Sessiam, who's a master carver. In 2018-19, he helped us carve the canoe that you see there. Um, the canoe has a name, it's Squichais. Um, it means sea lion, and Ray and his um, and his nephew, or no, and his and his um, cousin uh, Victor carved the canoe on campus in North Vancouver. It took them three months to carve it, and we all got a chance to carve it with them. And after after the three months, uh, Ray's family uh, gave the canoe to the to us as a university, a, a very important ceremony. The family gave it to us. Um, and, uh, and when he did, he whispered in my ear and he said, it's now yours for the next 200 years. Make sure you look after it. Um, and so we have, and what we've learned to do is become a canoe family. Now the canoe family means a lot to the Coast Salish. It's a little bit different up in Lillooet. Um, in Lillooet, the canoes were river canoes um, with the uh, Coast Salish. Obviously, they're all sea canoes. But what we do actually pay attention to is that it's about getting into the canoes together and paddling together. And that influences a lot of what I'm going to talk about later on. Um, I'm going to keep going here. Uh, all right. So uh, we graduate about, or about 1,100 um, uh, graduates every year from the programs that I said. Um, our, our student mix is about 65% um, Canadian, domestic Canadian, about 35% international. Those international numbers go up and down. Sometimes they're higher, sometimes they're lower. And we recruit students from around 80 countries from around the world to all our campuses. All right. Um, okay, we've got, we're recognized for alumni um, uh, from a, around the world. I love to show this slide. You will, if you listen to the Junos or you go to the Junos, every single Juno, uh, as an example, um, you will have at least uh, one of our alumni or one of our faculty are getting a Juno Award. And it happens every year. Um, and uh, that's because of so many of the great programs. I could say the same thing uh, and when, if you were looking at awards for environmental sciences or business, but I'd love to do a bit of a shout out. A couple other quick things. Um, back in 2017, we started um, converting 
uh, at the North Van campus anyway, and we're going to do that with other campuses from a commuter campus uh, to a uh, 724 campus. So we started on the project of getting our first housing uh, back in 2017. And right now on the North Shore um, campus, we, uh, are, we have a construction for another 370 beds. Um, with, and we're also working with um, uh, a partner to actually build an additional 300 beds. So the goal is to have about 1,000 beds on the campus um, in, the next, uh, in the next three to four years. Uh, and we're about a third of the way through that. Um, last but not least, just a shout out to our varsity athletes. Um, it's something we're very, very proud about. Uh, we have about 180 uh, varsity athletes in soccer, basketball, and uh, volleyball, um, and regularly make it to the nationals, regularly win one of them, and it goes in a cycle, but it's a, it's a lot of fun, and we're really, really proud of the athletes. I also like to show this because as a group, at 180 from across all of it, they have the highest GPA that we have at the university. So as a group, if you take a swath of any 180. so pretty, And that speaks to the type of importance that we put to the education, not just to the sports. All right. So the question I've been asking um, and I've been presenting on um, uh, around for about the last five or six years as I go internationally, everybody keeps talking about um, how surely to goodness higher education is going to get disrupted. In the same way Netflix did their disruption and you can, you know, there's all kinds of things that are causing disruption in, in the world. And back in t about 2010, 2011, um, uh, there's a book that came out that was called The Innovative um, University uh, by a fellow named Christensen. And he was talking about how things like massive open online courses were going to completely disrupt higher education. These are these online courses. And us and the academics went, well, I'm not so sure uh, that that's right. But it was the beginning of thinking about how you think about how universities and higher education is going to be disrupted. The reason we thought, and I still think, um, that things like MOOCs are not going to disrupt it is because of this. So um, you can't get this experience um, with a MOOC. So this is our first year. These are first year students in our motion, uh, uh, um, motion, motion picture arts program uh, learning about um, motion capture. And so uh, you can't get that experience in an online experience. But the activities that you see in this room and how you are actually going to be able to put this together as a university in the future. So your first year students, we're not talking about fourth year students or graduate students. These are first year students getting this type of experience with uh, a professor or a faculty or a teacher like Adam Sally, who's up there, who's a, an expert in uh, motion picture arts and digital animation. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money, that's a lot of skills, that's a lot of training. And so this is, in my view, is why we're not going to get disrupted by MOOCs, but it is why the industry is beginning to, or why we're beginning to see the sector is got to pay attention to what's going on because things are changing so fast. The technology in this course changes every semester, every single semester. So how do we actually keep up with it? So uh, just going back uh, to 2003 and what's different between now, uh, 2023, 20, uh, and back in 2003, I love to show this slide. Uh, there's some people here who may not have been around in 2003, I don't know. Um, but uh, I love to show this little picture. So uh, 2003, um, this guy actually started. Uh, he's retired now, or retiring. Uh, Ronaldo actually started things off. That was his first year that he played. And these are the kinds of things that were the environment. I was just beginning to teach, and the environment in higher education, I was finishing off my MBA, I was teaching a little bit. Um, and the things that are up there are really the way the world was for us in higher education. And you can see, you can see as you go through the, the windy bit there, it starts, everything we did was analog, um, completely analog. We were teach. there were only two generations at most universities. The baby boomers were teaching the millennials. None of the complicated environment that we've got now. Baby boomers just teaching to millennials. And you can see as you go through, our funding was actually pretty stable. I talked to uh, the president at the time, uh, Greg Lee. Yeah, funding was stable. We didn't have to worry about it. It was trucking along. No iPhones. Google was just getting started. 
Uh, very, very traditional lecture models. You did it up. You could probably use the same one year after year after year. You might want to use a few different examples. We stood up in front of the class. You talked. Students were all millennials. They all took it the same way. Uh, the programs are pretty traditional. Standard science degree, standard business degree. It's all pretty, pretty whatever. Some things that we weren't paying attention to, very colonial in the way we actually delivered our programming. We weren't really, we weren't aware of, um, I'll get to cybersecurity, but very, very in little interest. 2003 is not that long ago. People were not believing there were actually politicians in senior positions in our country, and still, I guess, so I apologize to our American colleagues here in the US, still didn't believe back in 2003 climate change was not a thing. The world was fine, it was just heating up. It, like That's the way people were thinking uh, back then. Um, almost no interest in how we create safe spaces in our classrooms. Uh, EDI was not a thing. Uh, equity, diversity, inclusion was not a thing. We weren't thinking about it, let alone thinking about truth and reconciliation and how we were looking after um, our folks. The one that just scares the daylights out of me is nobody, of course, back in 2003 was thinking about cybersecurity. My account gets attacked 100 times a day. 100 times a day. So, so that's the world that we're in, basically pretty static. Uh, life was pretty static. Fundamentally, the academic model that we have, uh, we have right now is still based on this, fundamentally. I've got rock star faculty that blow all this up, but fundamentally the structure, the, the sector is based on this model. So what's going on now? Um, I group these three things together, um, virtual systems, AI, and technology together. Virtual systems, there's now something coming out. If you ever, want to check out a really, really cool institution, Arizona State University, I was just back there uh, last week or the week before. Uh, they do immersive learning where they put you in a virtual reality classroom uh, when you're teaching biology, when you're teaching chemistry, when you're teaching whatever. Um, and they're now at the stage where they're saying is if you meet the entrance requirements into our biology 100 class, we guarantee you, 100% guarantee you, you will graduate or you'll finish this class on time. In biology, we have about a 55, most places have about a 55% uh, success rate through that program um, uh, for non-biology majors. So virtual systems are changing things. AI, there's two kinds of AI that we're paying attention to. There's the G. PT, the generative um, uh, um, transformers, uh, which is all about. That's the ones that uh, we as, as educators are really trying to get our heads around. But it's a pretty cool system, actually. Um, pretty cool system, and there are lots of folks that are thinking that they will become, uh, chat GBT will become the way in which you have, for, for both uh, faculty and for students, they become like your coach. You know, your right-hand person that's there to help you as you go through. So for, for faculty, they become like a teaching assistant. For the students, they become like a, a coach as they're going through and checking up on things. The worry, the one that everybody's worried about, isn't um, generative uh, transformation. It is um, those that actually uh, automate. So where you ask it one question, and then you say, can you work on this over the next two or three days and come up with a different idea? and actually starts generating its own ideas. And we can talk about that later if you want. That's pretty scary stuff. That's the part that's scary. Not the generative, because we can eventually figure out what we're going to put into it. It's the, it's the other one. So all of that is leading to change right now. Climate crisis and SDGs, um, I'm sure you've probably had some folks talk about it. You're seeing this globally. Um, all of these are actually global things. Climate crisis, um, it's, it's all making a difference. Um, and we need to be thinking about it in higher education. I mentioned equity, diversity, inclusivity. It's probably the number one thing that we're paying attention to if I would put that and then um, truth and reconciliation. These are things that are probably front and center for us most than uh, time. And weren't even a conversation 20 years ago. Um, I mentioned truth and reconciliation. The demographics are shifting. When I started in 2016 as the president, 80% of my employees were baby boomers. Now they're below 20%. Um, we also have different generations coming back to who are actually in the classroom, and it ranges completely. So we have a whole different ballgame than what we used to and how those demographics and where they're coming from is changing. When I used to teach uh, in 2005, the majority of our students who were international were coming from China. Now it's India or Persia 
or you know, Brazil. So it's constantly shifting. Um, I don't need to say enough about this. I, I was pretty optimistic in 2016 when I took over. Uh, the geopolitics of the world right now are just the impact that that's having. My colleagues and us, as we're having to deal with what's happened over the last two weeks, it's absolutely consuming all our students, it's consuming our faculty, and how we deal with it and choose not to deal with it, it it's, uh, it's pretty substantive. Um, economic realities, uh, we all know what kind of situation we are in, not just in Canada, but globally, and it's up and down, and that makes it really hard for us to figure out how we're going to financially sustain our, our organizations, and that's, uh, that's causing a lot of stress on folks. Um, our learners, so, or saying if I'm, you know, the way I like to say this is that if I'm going to pay seven, eight thousand dollars a year uh, over four years, call that whatever, that's about the price of a, a really nice car. Uh, can you imagine if, as the car dealership, you showed up and you said to that learner, uh, or you uh, at the, the car dealership, and you said, okay, we're going to tell you what kind of car you're going to get, uh, what color it's going to be, what kind of features you have on the inside of the car. You have no choice. Here's your car. There's no way any of us would put up with that. Rightly so, the students are saying, I need to be involved in my education. I need to be able to curate my education. I need to be able to curate my experience in the classroom and on the campus. And you better be paying, paying attention because I'm paying for this. Rightly so. But that's changing quickly. Uh, that whole thing is changing. Social demands a lot of expectations on us, making sure that my, you know, when, when I do the work that we do, uh, when my faculty do the work that they do, that when the students graduate, they're meeting your demands, your needs, what you need. Um, and it's uh, that whole thing, or, you know, you get them, you want them to be able to do the work. Um, you want them to be able to uh, be able to fit into the team. And so there's a lot of significant social demands that we've got. Um, and one of the most important things, and I'll talk about this later, is um, rightly so, uh, employees are actually demanding significantly more um, from us in higher education than they ever had. It used to be the old model as you, well, at CAP we were a little different because we were college and then we were university college and then university, but in higher education, you, you know of the whole tenure track kind of model. It was pretty clear. You know, you, get, you came, you, 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 you finished your PhD, you would go and you publish a couple papers, and the track was really clear. And you just, everybody just sucked it up and away they went, and they did it. Now they're saying, wait a minute, that's not good enough. You need to actually be an employer of choice. That wasn't happening seven or eight years ago. Um, and that's why we have, you know, quite vocal, understandably quite vocal unions that are saying, look, we're not doing a good enough job. And that's a global phenomenon as well. So, when I'm asked um, now, so five years ago I said, is, is higher education going to be disrupted? I used to say, not a chance. Uh, it's never going to get disrupted. Because I was looking for the one thing that was going to disrupt higher education. Now, all of these things, these are all little blocks. This is me being a little bit good with, um, uh, with PowerPoint. All these things that I just talked about are all happening at the same time and higher education is just being turned upside down. It's absolutely being turned upside down, and it's impacting everybody from uh, the staff to the faculty, the teaching assistants, right up to me and my executives, and how are we actually going to... I get asked questions about experiences, and you heard what I've done, and I've never seen some of these things before in 40 years of work. Um, and so there's a lot going on in this world. So I get asked, well, what are we going to do about it? Um, there are things that we can do, um, and there are a couple, three th things that I'd like to just talk about, and these are the things So I was just sharing with. I was in, actually in Ho Chi Minh uh, in June presenting to 12 ministers of advanced education from Southeast Asia, um, as if I have some kind of magic wand that I can say, here you go, this is, this is the future of education you need to think about. And I did a little bit of what we've just talked about now. I said, what are, what are, the, what are things that we can do um, to make sure that we've got this right so that we are actually going to be successful. So what I've been saying is there are three things. Um, now, three is an easy number to remember, and it's, it's usually good to stay focused on three things. So there's no real magic to this, but I've got three things that I think are really important. The first one is you actually have to understand, as I, we as, as 
post-secondary educators, we have to understand why we exist and what we're doing. What is our purpose? And if you don't have that, you're just wasting your time um, because you're just spending good money after bad. Um, I talked about the people. The most important thing in all of this, I've always said, if it, when I used to teach my uh, MBA classes, I would say, okay, you figure out your strategic plan, all that, whatever you want to do. None of that makes any difference if you haven't paid attention to the people. And that's why I emphasized earlier that you've got to be thinking about the people. And the, and the third is how the work is going to be done. Um, and at, in, in higher education, we don't move very quickly. Uh, we don't change very quickly, and we don't adapt very quickly. Our faculty might do in the classrooms and the things that they're doing, but the actual system and structures, we don't do very well. As I said, we used, prior to the pandemic, we were, so between 20, 2003, when I said, you know, everything was analog, right up to 2020, we were still analog. It was only because of the pandemic that we actually shifted um, as a sector. So a couple things on this. Uh, let me just do a couple shout outs here to show how CAP is actually addressing it. Um, back in 2019, um, we, uh, we started on a really important journey um, to figure out how, who we wanted to be and what, what we thought was important to us. And um, I'm just going to put this up so you can see it all. Um, and I'll just talk quickly about it. Uh, two, four, five. Okay. Um, what we did is we went through a process to figure out where we wanted to be in 2030. It didn't start like that. What we did was, my background's in the military, I'm going to teach MBAs and I do all that kind of stuff. So I said, we have to do a strategic plan for 2030. And of course, that, doesn't, that goes over fine with the business school, but it doesn't go over very well with School of Music and Jazz and your elders and all of those. So, we actually went through a process, like, we need to think about this a little bit differently. And so we worked with the elders. We started with how do we decolonize what we do. We worked with the elders. And they said, tell the story for 2030. What do you want to be? What do you want the university to look like in 2030? So that's what I'm saying to organizations. Make sure you're clear on what your story is. If you can look back, we had to go out to 2030 because we couldn't figure out what we wanted to do in a year from now. So we thought it's actually easier to figure out where we wanted to be 10 years from now. And we had some great conversations. And what we did is we went out to the community um, and we said, OK, what do we think we should be doing as a university in 2030? We started with our students. We started with our faculty and our staff. Then we went into the communities. We talked to the mayors. We talked to the councils. We talked to the chambers. We talked to the nations and said, what do we want to do? What do we want the future to be? And um, how are we going to differentiate ourselves? And we came up with this great little tagline that you'll see throughout a lot of our documents. You look on our websites. Is that we want to be a university inspired by imagination. I love to tell the story that that inspiration by imagination probably came out of our early childhood care and education program. We have two faculty that actually have PhDs in imagination. If you're going to be an ECE, that's probably the right place to do it. And they started thinking it's not about innovation. It's not about... Um, Technology is not about, it's a, you have to be imaginative before you can get to the innovation. And so we said, yeah, yeah let's start playing around with that. And then we said, okay, uh, how are we going to, again, you got to remember, we're looking across the water at UBC and, and uh, SFU and then just over the ridge up, up the hill to BCIT. These are big, big institutions. And so we said, how can we actually really differentiate ourselves? And he said, let's decolonize that mission statement that everybody has. I don't know if if here in Worcester you use mission statements, but the, the, the ministry still requires me to call it a mission statement. We said, no, we're not doing that. It's our purpose statement. Our purpose is to cultivate life-enhancing experiences for our learners, for our employees, for our alumni, and the communities like you. When that landed, we started thinking about things really differently. We said, okay, now we understand why we're here. And that helped us through the pandemic. That's helping us on our journey. It's helped us make our decision. Are we going to buy the campus in Squamish? It's helped us through all of those things because we understand why we exist as an entity. There are, when I ask this question um, globally and in other places, and just last or this week I was up at Universities of Canada in Ottawa, and I said, so what's the purpose of your organization? Great institutions in this country still have not been able to define where their, what their purpose is. We also spent a lot of time figuring out what our values are. These were critical because 
even though we're not perfect and we haven't got this exactly right, we actually put these into business cases. So when we are deciding whether we are going to do something as a business, we compare it to those business cases. Remarkably, I'll just I'll pick, you can see a couple of them. You think, well, you should probably all had all of those. We didn't. Those were not our values in our stated values prior to 2019. The only one that was actually was transparency and honesty in everything we do. So we didn't have a commitment to uh, decolonize, to indigenize, to truth and reconciliation. We didn't have a commitment to creating safe spaces for our employees. Um, we didn't have a commitment to sustainability. So when I say um, what the most important thing as you're trying to figure out how you're going to get through the next 10 years, if you can't do this, certainly at the leadership level, it's great if everybody else can do it. And if you can't do this, you're not going to, you're going to see the in, institutions in the future are, are going to struggle. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about people. Um, I had mentioned, so um, in 23, uh, 2033, so I'm just, I don't know why I did 10 years out, but it was a little bit easier for me to think that through. Uh, we will have millennials. So remember when I said it was the boomers teaching the millennials. Now it will be the millennials who will be teaching the generation alphas, so those that are here. Okay, so this is the generation that we're going to be teaching. So it's going to be interesting, but what we're finding is um, both, well, some, some of our employees are staying really long, um, which is fine, um, they're staying long, and some of um, our learners are coming back. Uh, so we often will have classrooms that will have different generations, but you really, really have to pay attention to the people and understanding the difference on, in demographics and it, not just the demographics of, um, of our domestic students and our domestic employees, but you all know that we're all in a, in a job crunch right now, and so it's just as difficult for me. I need to be thinking about how we're hiring faculty from around the world, not something that we do very often right now, but it is going to be a really big part of it. Um, getting specifically to the employees, um, I think this is probably going to be, and I... I say this when I'm in, in, in Ho Chi Minh talking to 12 different ministers. They're not hearing this. This is not what they're paying attention to. They're actually saying, okay, look, we just need to make sure that we got the right programs. You get the right people, you'll get the right programs. You get the right people, you're going to be able to handle the technology. You get the right people, you're going to be able to handle a crisis like what we just were going through right now in the last two weeks. Really paying attention to uh, the fact that it's multi-generational, Universities have never had um, in, it used to be really just LR, labor relations. We never did HR. We never did people. So I now have a VP of people, culture, and diversity. And we actually are now, this year, going to be uh, creating a learning and development department for the university to actually train our employees. You may be going, oh, what? That, that's normal, isn't it? Isn't that what all big organizations of 1,000 employees do? No. Higher education has not done this. This is new territory for higher education. Um, training, uh, making sure we've got flexible work for them. Health and well-being, we say health and well-being is now at the cornerstone for what we do. Um, making sure we're paying attention to all of these things for our employees to make sure that they've got what they need. Um, I probably would say of everything that once you make sure you understand your purpose, but you could argue if you don't have the right people with you, you're not going to be able to have the right conversation about what your purpose is. So I would argue this is probably one of the most important things we need to be getting right. Okay, how things get done. This is obviously all about the technology, the innovation. Um, the different things that are up there uh, that are fueling how um, organizations do things is on a massive, massive scale. Um, we don't yet get to, we're not yet as a sector at that place where we mine data, where uh, we're able to uh, use uh, different Google apps to actually figure out um, which students from which part of which communities are going to want to take which course. Um, and, and the way I describe that is like we can all get onto um, Expedia or something like that, and you can plan out your trip six months from now 
And you can pick everything from the hotel you're going to go, the vehicle you're going to have, the seat you're going to sit in. You can plan out everything. And then when you actually do all that, you hit confirm and you get instant response. Okay, I've got it. My trip's planned. There needs to be that same level of robustness around clever use of technology around how universities are, um, are run. Uh, and so there's a lot of things there that we need to be doing. Um, I did mention cybersecurity. Uh, it's probably the single biggest threat that we have right now, and it's massive. Um, there are uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, people around the world sponsored by governments that are trying to get into our universities right now and trying to figure out what we're doing. And it's everything from IP, from research, to how we're doing things, to ransomware. There are literally hundreds of thousands of people. And we're not, the interesting thing is we're not tr yet training enough folks um, in cybersecurity, counter cybersecurity, uh, to do these things. So this is going to be a big deal. But there's a couple of fun, oh, let me talk about SDGs. So uh, the standard that, uh, let's say a, a district is held up to, or a municipality or whatever, around how you deal with uh, sustainable de development goals, I can guarantee you that my students and my faculty want to make sure that we're doing everything to the absolute highest standard. And the previous slide on this slide, I don't get a penny for this. I get no funding for these things. There's absolutely no funding for this. It's just expected that we will figure out how to do it. It's good that they're figuring out how we actually do it, but how do we build it into the curriculum? How do we make sure that our new campus that we've got is actually is a green campus? If we're just told we have to do it. We're not actually being funded or supported to it. And that's right around the world. Unless you're U of T, um, which somehow has got just so much money to be able to do it, but most, unless you're you know, one of the top 100 universities in the world, the rest of us are trying to figure out how to fund these things, and they're massive amounts of things that are really knocking us off our stride. Uh, how many of you have actually started using Copilot yet? Microsoft Copilot on the technology side? Yeah, you got how to go at it? Wow. Okay, so uh, some of you are using Microsoft Teams, that kind of thing, and you know the different systems that are out there. So it's how you keep your, your calendar together, how you do your emails, all of that. So uh, this is actually an embedded link. You could go have a look at it if you want. I won't play it right now. So what Microsoft has done is they do Microsoft 365 is your email, your Teams meetings, which is how you communicate, your calendars, and a few other things. They now run this AI platform on the, on the back end of it. So it, this presentation I'm giving to you now, we could have a uh, co-pilot running in the background, um, and um, it would be listening in uh, to everything that we've talked about, um, and it would actually be able to do up, okay, this was Paul's presentation, create its own PowerPoint slides, and let's say we had a Q&A at the end of it, and we wanted to say, and I said, look, I'm going to have to look that up. I don't have an answer to it it would actually look that up, action it for me. So at the end of every meeting you do, at the end of every presentation you do, Copilot can run in the background and completely reorganize uh, everything that you do. Everything. It's absolutely incredible what it's working, what it's doing right now. Um, again, this is a, an embedded uh, video here, and I won't, I won't play it, but... Um, what are we doing? Um, we're taking, as I said, that our purpose um, as, a, as a university, our values, the things that are important, and we're actually putting together new programming. Uh, this is an example of one of the new uh, diplomas that we've just put out. Uh, it's called Humanizing Technology, and it's uh, in our um, uh, School of uh, Design, uh, and um, it's, it's this interaction of how um, our learners are able to work with faculty who are, have got expertise in the field right now. And um, these are mostly high school graduates going into the programming. And the level at which we're giving them what we call work integrated learning, real learning, they're getting it in the first semester of real time. And yet, we're still making sure that they're actually doing the kind of um, bigger picture thinking that you know everybody worries about, making sure they understand ethics, make sure that they understand 
that you would get in a four-year degree, we're now actually putting this into a two-year diploma. And it's just an incredible new way of actually thinking about it. And you can see that, so what we're trying to do is help our students make sure that they are future-proof, but they're actually helping the rest of you to be future-proof. And I guarantee you'd love to have uh, the graduates out of this program working with you. Um, same thing in our Bachelor of Science. Um, our B-Science is actually a, a completely redesigned science degree. You heard my undergraduate degree is in, in, in chemistry and sciences. Um, in our first year, our students are actually doing research. In our first year, our students, for example, are working with the Halo Sound Biosphere. In our first year, they're actually doing technology. In our first year, they're actually learning about truth and reconciliation. By the time they get to fourth year, you know, so there, this, this whole idea that you, ha you either, you know, I, what we're trying to disrupt here is that, uh, that that notion that universities are there just to get you to think big and institutes of technology are there to teach you how to do. There's absolutely no reason with careful design by somebody like one of those design students that you can't do your curriculum that is doing both. And that helps address a lot of those factors that I've said um, that are really disrupting higher education. Because students are saying, hey, why is it worth it? Why would I do four years of science degree? What am I going to do with that? I'm gonna, then going to go on and have to do a million other things. Well, we're going to make sure in your first semester you're actually already figuring that out and you know what you want to do. And so that's a brand new redesign. I know a cool thing was when we took this through the system to get it approved, both SFU and UBC got, oh, God, we wish we could deconstruct our degree and get that back in, but it's too embedded. It's one of those advantages we have of being a new university. All right. Um, I'm going right on time. Okay. So uh, I hope you see the difference in this slide uh, from the first slide. I tried to bold it here at the end. All right. Um, so the question I'm asking, uh, I ask everybody, the question I'm asking my folks is are we ready for the next set of paradigms? And so it's not just one paradigm. It is going to keep going at this pace. In fact, the way I put it, and my faculty, my folks have heard me say it, this moment in time that we are in right now is the slowest pace of change that we will ever know. And so, I come back to, are we going to be ready for it? Um, and I say, yes, we are, if we make sure we understand why we exist. Have we got the right people who are going to help us get through there? And are we staying on top of our technology as we're going through things? So there we go. I think three minutes early. Pretty good. OK. There we go. Happy to take any questions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Organize the stage so Paul can sit down for a little bit and rest that uh, boot. Mm. That was um, actually pretty so good. So, Jim, we just move the, we think we'll move these chairs in a little closer, and then it's mm. time for uh, QA. And Paul also indicated that he wanted to touch on a few of these topics that weren't in his uh, yeah. presentation. Happy so. to talk a little bit more about what, what our plans are for, for Squamish because I know folks are interested in that. But if that's the kind of thing, or we can go out globally and see what's going on globally. So, whatever you like. So there's a question. Okay. So could you, let's say we have two students, two high school students who want to go into engineering. Yep. Could you compare and contrast the learning profiles of which students would do better in a traditional paradigm like UBC engineering versus Kaplan or University engineering? Yeah, good question. Um, The, the way I like to put it, what, when we understand, and we do this because we understand our purpose and what we're here for and who our learners are going to be, I'll use two quick analogies. Um, one's a sporting analogy, and I, I think I can use that because there's enough athletic folks, and I'll use a, a, a more of a creative analogy. The way I look at it is at Kaplan University, if you take baseball, we take most of our learners, um, and if you're about to you know, get up to the plate and bat, uh, we take the students from the dugout, move them up to home plate, show them how to get ready to see the ball, um, uh, show them how to get their first bat on and then get onto base, how to steal a base, how to get around the base, and then how to get home, all the way home. So how you get all the way around that whole circle. 
Most UBC students that are going to be successful, they start on third base and somebody bunts them home because they're, they're going to be successful regardless of where they go, especially in engineering because it's really hard to get into that program. The other analogy I love to use is, uh, is more of an, uh, a creative analogy is um, if, if you want your child to play uh, music and be in the orchestra, you know, you start in the junior orchestra, the senior orchestra, third string, second string, eventually you're actually, you know, first string. Um, we actually take everybody right through that. So it's usually for the students that want that or need that entire experience. What I would also say is that um, what we are trying to do is uh, make sure right from the beginning they're engaged in engineering or they're engaged in sciences. So my undergraduate degree, I mean, everybody took the same sciences for the first two years and then we specialized in the third and fourth. We just don't, we don't do that. We make sure that in, in, a, in your business course, first year you actually have a chance to work in businesses um, and work with businesses. We don't wait till your fourth year capstone project. Um, I think this, those that go on to the big um, universities tend to go on and do graduate school as well. And so that's, that is a better path. Uh, is if you want to go on to grad school and do other things, um, then right now uh, we're about to roll out our graduate program. But I, th I think that's what I would say. Uh, it's the c small classrooms. It's the more intimate. You're, you're going to get called out. Like if you want to sit in a classroom with, uh, and you're doing Algebra 100 with three, 400 people and you want to just hide, um, I'm saying that kind of. But if, if you're trying to do that in uh, CAP, you're not going to hide. Um, but the other thing is, you're also going to have that really good experience with folks who are actually you know, really hands-on. So. Yeah. You mentioned advantages to being a new university. You gave yeah. an example yeah. of uh, in, um, yeah. the NSFU have entrenched Bachelor of Science program or degrees in yeah. that Bachelor of Science program and uh, that they envied yeah. Yeah. your new one. Yeah. Can you expand? Yeah, yeah. Like th there are some things that there are advantages, but there are also some things I'm very envious of. You know, the the the, uh, the universities have been around uh, a long time. They've got the content that you would see at the big university. That's that's one of the things that's really incredible. So you have so many electives, so many opportunities. The advantage that we have is that we can actually start creating new content that is more relevant, potentially more rele uh, relevant. So by, by way of example, um, we're designing new degrees that make sure that um, we use um, uh, indigenous case studies right from the very, very beginning and is built right through. So that's actually more relevant to us as opposed to having to go back and revamp an entire program. Um, I think, um, I think the use of some of the technologies too. Uh, we're a new university, but we're also a little bit smaller too, is the fact that we can, uh, we, we've also been always been focused on teaching. Uh, so we're a teaching university. So thinking about how we can use uh, immersive learning is something that um, I think we're gonna be able to do that um, the larger university. I can't imagine how difficult it would be to go to one of the larger universities and say, you know what, we're going to change how you teach Biology 100. Um, we're going to move it to a virtual space. Um, and you're going to, you know, you're going to put on, and when I say virtual, I mean like um, VR, you know, immersive space. And that's how we're going to um, do at least some of your labs and stuff like that. We're small enough, uh, we're new enough that we can say, hey, that might be a cool technology. Let's try it and pilot it. Um, so. There are a number of those things that I think are, are really interesting too that we're going to be able to do. I think the other two is our partnerships too. We're, we're looking at how we can partner with the big universities, how we can partner internationally. Uh, so what I wish we had, and I'll just say it because it's a bit of a plug when I'm talking about the fact that I, it's a struggle here to finance. To, you know, we, we don't have the same fun funding model um, that the, uh, the big universities have. We're still trying to get that sorted out. And so, it, and what that does, that forces us to be more nimble, more clever about how we do things. So, there we go.
Uh, I would say if, at this, is it happening right now? No, are we thinking about it? Absolutely. Um, it, it, most of that though is taking place in the teaching uh, centers for teaching excellence, the learning and teaching centers, trying to figure out what we want to do. Um, and we're also talking with the ministry. Um, I, it was interesting, the question, that same question came up this week uh, when I was in Ottawa, and that question was asked of Universities Canada. The answer at Universities Canada level uh, was no, um, the students are going to have to figure that out when they come. Uh, and I, I, just being really honest, that was the answer today that was given. And this, you know, like these were all the big, all of all 97 universities, the general consensus. I think what we're trying to do is say, okay, how do we work with specifically with the school district? And how do we actually build those relationships with the school district? My preference is um, that we actually get it so that, you know, we were able to, you know, grade 12, you know, we're, we're actually transitioning really quickly. And that's one of the things that I think we're going to have to do. Um, so what, we, and th maybe that's also to one of the advantages that we have is that we can work directly with you uh, in the school districts. And that's one of the things that we're doing. But I would say nationally and internationally, uh, nope, it's not, not happening yet. Um, I think, I think it, it is going to be something that will be interesting. I think people are, more, some of the Centers for Teaching Excellence are, are considering um, learning outcomes as opposed to grades. So what do you want? And, and that's why I've, I'm, I'm thinking that we need to be thinking more about not just what we've learned, but what you can do with what you've learned. And so, uh, you know, you, you do a project where you work, a city studio project, which is a project where you work with the municipality, a group of students go and solve a problem at the district or at the municipality. And then you evaluate how that went. Did you reach the outcome? I think more and more we're thinking about outcomes. We are anyway. Think about outcomes. One of the other interesting things too is that when we talk to our, our um, indigenous community too, they're saying, why can't we do what you're suggesting? And we're going, ah, we don't know why we can't. And so I think that's where you're going to actually see one of the labors of, in higher education. Sorry. But I just... Really, be honest with you, I don't think, I can tell you Miguel isn't thinking about it, UT's not thinking about it, Western's not thinking about it, Concordia aren't thinking about it. That's not where they're at right now. We'll work with you, though. Wow, perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, Jamie, a little Mickey, it's hard to see up there. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, lots of things I think they're in flight um, that we are going to be working on. And we, we have a uh, continuing studies program that we would do that would be for working professionals. Um, it's really interesting, too, just a little bit of a background. I mean, everybody's heard about micro-credentials. Have you heard that kind of term? Where everybody's saying, oh, yeah, micro-credentials are the way of the future. Uh, they work in some program areas. I know BCIT does quite a bit of it, and they do them really, really well. Um, the, the challenge with, with um, the micro-credentials or even just the continuing studies is the numbers are really, really small. Um, so let, let's say here in a year we wanted to do a uh, continuing studies or micro-credential for your, uh, the generation that you're talking about that want to learn about artificial intelligence or machine learning. Um, you know, we would put that out, maybe get 20 students willing to pay whatever amount that they would want to do. Meanwhile, LinkedIn Learning and everybody else is doing it for whatever they're doing it for, BCIT is doing it. So what we're actually thinking we, we need to do is actually work directly with the Whistler Institute, with the chambers, with the school districts, and say, okay, how can we work together with you? And let's put together a package on what are SDGs and how's that going to impact your business? And how can we actually work with you on it? So, um, we will be we will be work. We're probably going to have our if it, five years from now. I would imagine Squamish is where we're, uh, the Squamish campus is where we're going to be doing most of what you're talking about. Um, so that's where I'd like to actually get it set up. But what I have to do is make sure that Bachelor of Science is really really stable. Um, that that you know uh, the degree that we do in clean technology or digital. Um, uh, um, digital science or whatever we want to do, it, they've got to be big enough and strong enough and financially stable enough so that when we actually pull a faculty tour out, really it's, it's, it's almost, I'll use a business term, almost like a lost leader for us. But it, because we've said 
we want to cultivate life enhancing experience for the community, we're willing to do it. But I have to make sure I've got the other parts of that working. And that's why CAP struggled um, back in the, uh, in the 90s and 2000s, or by the 2000s. We're doing great work at CAP in Squamish, but the numbers just weren't there. So that's why we want to go back with degrees uh, that will then support the kind of programming that you're talking about. Paul, would you like to touch on a little bit on uh, your plans for the Squamish campus? Or sure. some plans that you might have for the corridor? I think that would be yeah. very interesting for us. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, going way back, when I, when I first started um, in, two, in the fall of 2016, uh, and I went and visited uh, the mayor, Patty Heinzman, at the time, and visited her and said, look, you know, uh, sorry we're closed down, we need to think about this, but the model doesn't work, so I've got to spend some time figuring out what the model is, but we will be back. <laughs> um, and, um, and then it was just about trying to figure out, it took me four or five years to figure out what really what the model was, we had other things that we were working on, and I had to get the financing for it. Um, you may have heard that we were actually planning on going into the oceanfront properties, uh, right on the oceanfront. We would purchased a couple acres of land. The uh, ministry was fantastic. They, they supported us with, um, through Treasury Board to get some funding to build a 46,000 square foot campus, and then we were going to work on housing, because uh, you can't actually do a program in the valley without the housing. Um, and so that's where we were going to go. It was all set to go. We had the business case was done, and I'm not exaggerating. The same week, um, the uh, the Squamish campus, the former Quest campus, came up for sale. And so we just shifted. And I called the minister and said, and the deputy minister said, "Would you rather spend, you know, the money on a built campus or one that we will see in three, four years?" And this is a bit of a no-brainer. And we all jumped on it. And as you know, that that's the outcome. The tricky part with that was that I wasn't planning on actually having programming running till 26, um, and now we have a whole campus. So the idea was phase one would be 26, phase two would have been 27. Uh, phase one um, now is going to be next summer, uh, or next fall, so fall of 24. And, and back to that model that I was sharing with you, so I kind of lead in that, that the question is that we're gonna start with what I would say are a couple of our anchor programs uh, early childhood care and education, probably something in sciences or environmental sciences that's big enough that we can actually, you know, we can have a couple hundred students on the campus in the beginning. And then phase two will continue to actually add more programming. But you can imagine the kind of programming that we would be doing will be programming to support uh, the Squamish Nation, the Lillooet Nation, but also programming that will attract uh, Indigenous uh, students from across the country uh, that we're going to look at how we put in there. Uh, there'll be a spe specific work. I'm working with uh, Nicola Valley Institute uh, right now on how, what that would look like, and we'll work with our colleagues up in Tizil. Uh Education, uh, we think we need to be doing something in education, for sure. Um, I might say a B.Ed., but don't quote me on it, but something like that will probably be where we would need to be. Uh, probably something in health sciences as well. Um, we have a bachelor in kinesiology. Mm, maybe we could do something in kinesiology, maybe eventually into something that's uh, going to be able to support the, uh, I'm looking at the mayor, maybe something to support the, the hospital directly here um, in the clinic. Um, so those type of programming that we would look to actually put in there. And then the fun, exciting ones. <laughs> so get all those ones up and running. The fun, exciting ones will be environmental science, clean tech, graduate studies, um, you know, maybe an animation programming, maybe film um, working with the house, so that's, but we need to get the, the groundwork done first. Um, and that will probably take, uh, I, I'll be spending the next three to four months figuring out what exactly that looks like and the team that we need to hire. Um, and just on that note, we hope to be hiring as many folks as we can from the Valley um, and that may want to, or people who left and now see a chance to come back and teach at a university or instruct. Um, I heard, yeah, you're saying oh, we've even got some of our, our faculty here teaching down there next fall. So that's kind of the process that we'll be, we'll, we'll be looking at. I hope to do an open house in around uh, February uh, in, down in Squamish. Just to, by then, I, that should give me enough time to, to flush out kind of what I've shared. I mean, you're getting a real sneak. I, I haven't even told my, my, the university everything I just told you, so that's a sneak peek. Um, I'll be doing that actually next, next week at, a, at a, my monthly update. But that's the type of thing that we're working on. I just ask that 
you know, we would love to be able to just open it, you know, switch, uh, uh, flick a switch and open everything right now. Um, but we're looking at some fun things. I think what we've done is we were actually going to host the, uh, at the Nationals uh, for soccer um, and the North End. We're actually going to now do it in Squamish because there's that great pitch there. So, um, so we're going to be doing some fun things with it. I'm really, really exciting about it. I'm just asking people, a little bit patient. We've got, we're building a whole bunch. We're doing a whole bunch on, on our existing campuses, so we're just going to get ourselves ready to go for that. So, yeah. More questions for Tracy? Oh, Tracy? Yeah, going back to your presentation, but you're talking about buying more resilient and aging and resilient food. I'm a little bit self-serving because I'm actually nine years old. Yeah. But given what you can see in the, the I mean, public generation alpha, yeah. Um, well, if you think about uh, those that were kind of joined, uh, born in sort of the 2000 to, you know, 2005, we, we would call them digital, right? They're digital na natives, like, so I, they're, they're used to that word. So um, I, my, my take on it is that they will be so comfortable with um, things like uh, artificial intelligence, um, machine learning, augmented reality, immersive reality, that um, I'm actually pretty excited about that generation because there's a couple things that we haven't been able to solve. There, ha there are problems that we haven't been able to solve because we spend too much time on it. Um, I think they're going to say, well, they'll constantly ask, them, why do I need to learn that? I'm just going to ask X. And, and I think there is a problem with that. But at the same time, you know, we've been struggling with trying to solve cures for cancer. We've been struggling to solve cures for, you know, uh, our, our climate action. We've been struggling with some of these things. I think they're going to say, I don't need to know that because I'm going to solve for cancer. And, 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 I, and that's going to be a real tension, I think, um, for parents. Um, I think that's going to be a real tension for teachers in the K-12 system, and I think that's going to be a real tension for faculty. Um, because clearly by 2030, um, I think that generation will be curating their own programs. And they're going to say, this is what I want to take. I'm not going to waste time with that. This is when it... And as long as you know, we've got the values lined up, they're saying, I don't want to do that because I've got bigger and better things that are more important for the world. That's a good thing. So it's going to be a really tricky ethical piece that we're going to have to, have to go through. So. I don't know if that helped, but yeah, thanks. Yeah, I'm really worried about it. Um, and, I, you know, I wonder what the leaders in, of uh, universities will be in the future. Are we really going to be educators? Are we just really going to be people who can figure out that? You know, good educational business leaders, I guess, is where I'm going. At. So when I, when I show all those things that we do, I don't get any funding for any of the work that we do for our, our Indigenous community. I get $285,000 a year uh, to support all the work that we do around indigenization. And my budget is $4.5 So where does that money come from? Um, and so it comes from the students. So I, we have to offset it through tuition, through international students, through research grants, through other things that we do. I get no money for uh, climate action. I get, we're, we have to be, we have to meet the standards that everybody else has, and we don't get any additional funding for it. Um, we don't get uh, any funding for cybersecurity. Uh, all that that I've told you, we don't get any funding for. So where does it, how do we, what do we do? We end up downloading that to students. Um, and obviously that's not the right way to do it. Um, so we need to actually start thinking about um, other things that we do. Um, you wonder, okay, well, how does a UBC do it? 
we all know how they do it. Um, they've got an incredible city. Um, the UBC property trust, the city, the lands, they, that helps them uh, with it. They attract millions, hundreds of millions of dollars in, uh, in, in research grants and they bring that in. But for a new university like us, we need to think about clever things like how do I monetize the lands in Squamish? Make sure that the, I joke, um, we need a casino. <laughs> but what is the casino in academic terms? It needs to be something clever. And that's why, in part, what I'm thinking about is that we need to think, it's the, it's the, uh, the you know, um, think, uh, think globally but act locally. Um, we need to actually take our business um, internationally, and that's why I spend a lot of time international and trying to figure out how those partners are. Um, it will be the biggest challenge that we'll have, at least as a society, as we try and figure out how we're going to support this. Uh, you know, colleagues in, in Germany just don't have this problem, because they just say right off the top, 5% GDP goes to supporting universities, done. And we don't have those numbers. We actually have to constantly. And that's why I rely on folks like a lot of you. Um, I fundraise a lot. Um, so, you know. the, so does the Whistler Institute. Yeah, Whistler Institute. So uh, we, we're, we're building, we're building um, uh, on, our, on our campus, we're building a new center of excellence for um, uh, early childhood care and education. And more than half of that funding for that project came from donors. So we have to get really clever. So I worry about it, yeah, I do. Uh, and I, do, I, I think the only way to out of it is we've got to get really clever with uh, our, our global partners, our community partners, how we use our land um, better. Um, and you know, I sure would like to see that right off the top, you know, a certain percent. I, pay me now or pay me later, we're all paying it, or our kids are paying for it anyway, right? So why not just pay it in taxes? That's so those are the worries. <laughs> yeah. What's the most exciting? Most exciting. Really gets you going. Uh, honestly, um, I think we're we're in a pretty spectacular um, part of the world, um, and you know we, we we reach all the way up I mean, a little bit further north from here and up the Sunshine Coast. And I I see I I know it sounds kind of glib or you know whatever. I see a lot of opportunities in our communities, despite the challenges with finances and some of the other things. Um, because we seem to know who we are um, in our region, um, and we seem to have that belonging. So, I, you know, having relationships with the school district, having a relationship with the Whistler Institute, having a relationship with the, with the municipalities, I love being able to do that. And I think that power of being able to do that collectively will mean that over the next 10 years, we will really be able to serve you um, in a way that, you know, I think, I think we were, 10 years ago, we were a little confused about how we wanted to do that. Now we know we're, that's our job. That's what we should be doing. Um, we're there to make sure that we attract uh, students um, from around the world, from all walks of life, with all levels of uh, access to, um, to uh, education, and we're going to be able to take them through to be successful and then work with you. Um, and uh, and whatever field it is you you, you have, and I, I am really really excited about that. And I do think we're actually going to solve some of the world uh, the problems that you see in the world. And obviously, you know, you can tell I'm pretty passionate about the work that we need to do with the nations. I'm pretty passionate about climate action. Pretty passionate about health and well-being. These are things that I think we can actually be global leaders in. Um, and it could it be that we could just be global leaders in in these kind of partnerships. So I have. Um, I see the mayor is up here, but. I have I'm about to sign an agreement, public agreement, with, um, with the uh, District of Squamish. Um, I've done that with the City of North Vancouver. I've done it up in Seashell. These are things that are really, really cool that you don't get to do if you're a big university up on it. Like, you get to do these really, really cool things to be able to work in the community. And I, I'm pretty excited about that. In yeah. really cool communities. And co like, it doesn't get any better than this. <laughs> it really doesn't. So, yeah. Thank you very much.
I'd like to thank uh, Cascade Environmental for, uh, for your support. Um, very much appreciated. If you enjoyed tonight, I encourage you to visit our website, whistlerinstitute.com, where there are links um, to join our newsletter, learn more about uh, what the Whistler Institute does and how you can get involved and support us. The next event in this series is planned for March the 7th, when a panel will discuss the future of healthcare, and in particular, Simon Fraser's new innovative um, uh, healthcare center or training of, of medical doctors. So we're looking forward to that. And uh, then April 4th, we will be joined by a panel discussion about concussion in sports. So we know that that's a big issue and, and uh, interest of, for, the, for us here in Whistler and those involved in sports. So um, thank you so much for coming out and we wish you all the best and look forward to seeing you at future events. <laughs>